Good morning, everybody. Uh, we're going to start uh, with your skills uh, shortly. I'm going to go through uh, some of the things you definitely need to know for the skills we're going to be performing, which is electrical therapy. I kind of went over the basic uh, motor functions, right? How to defibrillate, cardioverting pace. I put those videos up, so if you want to take a look at that, you're more than welcome to do so. Right? Uh, today, I'm going to focus on your monomorphic ventricular tachycardias in terms of uh, treatments, how to identify them, right? Uh, and also talk about stable and unstable brain dysrhythmias. Uh, the reason why I want to go through these particular things is that uh, I've been, you know, doing some testing and some practice runs with you guys. Uh, I noticed some of you have the same, um, you know, confusion or you're making the same mistakes collectively. And the reason why this is very important for these rhythms is that inappropriate treatment can kill a person. Right? Or a misinterpretation of the rhythm can cause serious uh, damage, right? So lethal damage, right? To the point that the person is not coming back. So I think it's important to review some of these form, uh, things, pharmacology, rhythms, and so forth. So today we're going to do monomorphic rhythms. That's your standard ventricular tachycardia. Next week we're going to go through polymorphic, right? Polymorphic means there is, a, it doesn't look uniform, so we'll talk about that. So monomorphic ventricular tachycardia is the name of this mono, right? Mono means one morphology. Morphic stands for morphology. So one morphology, so all your uh, R waves, right, are going to look what? Same. Uniform, same, exactly, right? So that's what you're looking for. The moment it looks same and they're white in nature, faster than 150, you're probably dealing with monomorphic ventricular tachycardia. The moment that morphology changes, it doesn't matter if it's a specific uh, polymorphic Ideology. So, like we have an example, torsades, right? Torsades, the flock. It's a specific polymorphic V type, right? But there are other kinds of polymorphic. How do we know it's polymorphic? The moment the morphology of the R waves differs, right? So we see, right, the uh, for the monomorphic, they're regular, right? A rate is above 150, that's when we need to intervene. It could be up to 200 beats per minute. But polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, that's the, the whole mark of it, right? That's varying QRS morphologies. So it doesn't have to be torsades. It could be any uh, etiology, right, uh, that's showing you varying QRS morphology. So any type of uh, polymorphic dysrhythmia, wide in nature, and it has different morphologies also of your R waves. I'll show you some examples of what they are. So what causes these, right? So the, the, the major causes, right, for ventricular tachycardia is ischemic, right, and not ischemic cardiomyopathy, right? Anyone know what, what is cardiomyopathy? Yeah, so can you give me an example? Okay, so the ischemia, so what does the word ischemia mean to you? The prime of oxygen? The, right, so it's lack of oxygen secondary to uh, lack of blood flow, right? So lack of blood flow to the area, which is going to cause the area to become ischemic, right? Less oxygen is getting delivered to the area. So this ischemic cardiomyopathy is usually secondary to a heart attack, right? And then you have remodeling that occurs on the on the myocardium. Not ischemic causes, right? This, this is your like dilated cardiomyopathy, restricted cardiomyopathy, uh, uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and those could be genetic causes, right? Uh, uh, those could be things like you have a lot of deposits of iron in your body through abnormal metabolism. Uh, you may have high blood pressure that's causing remodeling, right? Over the time. You may have valvular heart problems, or you may have things like rheumatic fever, or defective uh, things that cause remodeling of the heart. So you have uh, uh, different types of cardiomyopathy. For your purposes, right, uh, which you want to remember, ventricular tachycardia, right, is most common in ischemic causes and non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. But oftentimes when we have someone who has a thrombus formation, right, like your ACS, acute coronary syndromes, MI, right, those usually will have polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. Right? So this is just to show you an example. The top one, right, the morphology looks uniform. Everybody agree? Right? So, <coughs> bless you, right? How would we get the rate? If I, if I start at this line, right, I know the next one is going to be what? 300. The one over is going to be 150. So this uh, uh, rhythm, right, this R wave is before the 150, so it may be 160, 170, somewhere around there. So we're definitely about 150, right? Everybody agree? Everybody say this is uniform looking, yep. right? So, uh, and we will interpret this as ventricular tachycardia. Why? Because it's wide in nature, greater than 150, right? At the bottom, the, does the morphology look the same? 
Right? Okay. Everybody would agree this is polymorphic, right? Yeah. How would I know? How would I know this is a polymorphic reticular tectonic? I also look at my R waves. So the R waves, I see there's at some point there's regularity of it. This is a particular polymorphic. This is torsad, right? But you may have other polymorphic tachyarrhythmias that are not torsad, right? Any questions about this? A little tip. A little tip I can give you guys when you're doing this on the monitor. Uh, can you? Turn here. So we're looking at your rhythms so that you don't confuse, let's say, this rhythm with V fin, right? So the moment I put uh, ventricular tachycardia on my monitor, so I see ventricular tachycardia on the monitor, you know, you notice there's a heart rate, right? The heart rate doesn't mean the, the person has a heart rate. It's just what the monitor is sensing, right? R to R. Do you see this number? It's not jumping, right? Everybody agrees it's not jumping? Yes. It stays consistent? Look what I do when I put ventricular fibrillation. So the ventricular fibrillation is usually irregular, right? And you notice how the heart rate starts to jump around? Right? So that is a clue that I'm probably not dealing with ventricular tech part. I'm going to put polymorphic form. Right? So this is a polymorphic form. This is, this is actually torsades the way they have it um, here, twisting of the point, right? So uh, here, Right? Uh, it will fluctuate, right? So you may say, oh, I think it might be ventricular fibrillation. But look closely at R2R. -R. If your R2R, -R, right, look regular at some of these complexes, most likely you're dealing with ventricular type of party, right? So pay attention to what I'm saying is look at these, right? You see how they uniformly spaced out, right? So look at the monitor, right? And don't call out the first thing that comes to your mind, right? But look at it and interpret, right? And then uh, make appropriate uh, treatment, right, decision. So, we'll go forward. All right, so here, the other hallmark, this is another example of uh, monomorphic ventricular tachycardia. Notice, right, they're showing you P waves. This is called atrial ventricular disassociation, right? And why this occurs is because atria is still contracting and the ventricles uh, are beating at a Let's say they're irritable, they're beating at their own ectopic rate, which is faster than the SA node. But you still see at some points you have each air that's coming through. This is like pathognomonic of VTAC. Meaning if you see this, this is 100% you're dealing with ventricular attack party, right? And here we also see the wide in nature, right? All the complexes. Right? This is V2, but this is your precordial V. This is V1. And P, these are the P waves that are still going through. So each air can still contract against a closed. Uh, uh, AV valve, right? Because the ventricles are contracting at the same time. So you will see these. Sometimes you'll, these patients will have displayed, they call canon A waves. Canon A waves is like pulsations on the jugular veins when atria contracts, but the AV valve is closed because the ventricles are contracting at the same time. So they may have like pulsations on the jugular veins or not. Okay? Uh, this here is also a form of ventricular tachycardia, but this is not sustained. Right? So you see how the person was having, let's say, a normal rhythm, right? And you see how all of a sudden he has this burst, right, of ventricular tachycardia. And then he automatically converts back and then another burst, right? So this is still a form of ventricular tachycardia, right? We definitely want to address and treat it in case, <coughs> right, this person is to convert to sustain ventricular tachycardia. Uh, your monitors will definitely flag it and they'll say, like, you know, VTAC if, if this were to occur, right? So definitely pay attention uh, to this. Uh, this is not normal condition. If you have, yeah, usually if you have three runs, so the moment you have one, two, three PVCs in a row, we usually classify that as run of VTAC. But here you definitely have uh, a bigger run. Uh, anyone can tell me what can cause this? What can cause this? Yeah. Like how, how does it, like what brought brought this condition on or what can bring it on? Is that the RNT phenomenon? Uh, so this is not per se RNT right now, right? I'm, I'm just saying like you have a burst of V-type. What can cause V-type like this? So sure. Huh? Ischemia. Ischemia. And explain how. Um, <laughs> it just happened. All right, all right. And you, any other idea? What about ectopic bits? Ectopic bits. These are ectopic bits. I'm saying what causes them? Oh. <laughs> yeah. I don't think hyperkalemia. 
hyperkalemia. The hyperkalemia may cause may cause uh, what looks like uh, ventricular tachycardia or VTAC. Usually, the rate is not going to be above 150, right? And that's not true VTAC that I'm talking about. That's caught, caused. What she said is correct. It's caused through ischemia, right? But I'm saying like, what's how th does that happen? Yeah, ischemia is correct, but how does it happen? Yeah. Uh, maybe the person suffers from angina. Okay, but how, how does the ischemia event trigger this? So you guys, like you guys, are uh, close in the area, but nobody's saying the correct answer, right? So remember, uh, do you, you want to say something? I'm saying maybe the coping mechanism to try to perfuse an area of tissue that's been uh, ischemic. So, so you may have that, but the, what I'm saying is, I want to know the mechanism. So the mechanism is that remember I was telling you in the AMP lecture, cells are bags of potassium, right, in the CO sodium. So if I uh, we're going to come back to this, so I want to make sure you guys understand this, right? So I was saying to you guys, right, because any cell in your body, by your side, or whatever, there are bags of potassium and they're surrounded by sodium. Everybody agree so far? Yep. So what happens if you have ischemia, right, that's not uh, corrected? Those cells, this is the surrounding of the cell, right? Due, due to ischemia, you may have some myocardial damage. And that cell wall may get damaged because of ischemia. And what do you think is going to leak out to the surrounding? Potassium. Potassium, right? So potassium leaks out, <coughs> this is going to cause... Uh, yeah, exactly. So we, we know the cells have a, a resting negative threshold. You have changes in your uh, extracellular cations. And the moment you have changes in extracellular cations, you, that may cause depolarization right, to occur, right? So this is basically what happens in ischemia, right? Uh, cells dump their potassium contents, and then we see this manifesting as this, right? Uh, so if this is occurring, you definitely want to uh, so how correct. does it correct on its own? How does it correct on its own? So it depends on, right, uh, how much of it is leaking out, right? So maybe enough of it leaked out in that particular location that it's triggered this. And then I say no, again, fired, and then it uh, made sure, like, all the... SAAV and then it went back to the original configuration. However, the, the moment it's become sustained, meaning the, there's enough of the stimulus of cations to cause more and more of those ectopic beats, they will take over the conduction system, right, from cell to cell. Even though SA node, AV node is our, you know, uh, preferred method of conduction. Yeah. Let's say one cell Yeah. It, 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 so if, if you're saying if you open the ischemic area, yeah, you will, you, that, yeah. Why, why do you think they take patients? You got, you're working up a cardiac arrest, right? Patient was in VTAC, you brought him back, you do an EKG, you notice there's a STEMI, you take him to the cath lab. Like, uh, like, for yeah. So that's a different ideology. That's a, like a vasospasm that's causing it, right? So you open the vasospasm, you should stop. Uh, those patients don't usually have an inherent thrombus uh, formation when they have breakage of the cells per se, right? Yeah, so so you could give them medications to help them. These patients in particular that we worried about, this is usually brought on ischemia secondary to uh, acute coronary syndromes, right? Like an MI. And what happens is the ischemic area, right, uh, starts to lose potassium into the surrounding cells, triggering this. The reason why I want to focus on this one uh, is that this is life-threatening, right? And if you don't correct this, the person's going to die. And if you give the wrong medication, right, you also can kill a person. All right. So, uh, so as I said, right, ischemic heart disease is the most common cause, right, of sustained of sustained ventricular tachycardia. And then what happens in these ischemic conditions, especially in acute coronary syndromes of ACS, right, they get a breakout polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. Right, not torsades per se, right? Any other type of polymorphic VTAC. And that can essentially proceed down to ventricular fibrillation. And this is essentially the persons you find who have chest pain, now they're unconscious, or you go to a scene and they're unconscious of cardiac arrest, and you start working them up. Initially, they may be in VTAC or they may be in VF, right? And most likely, the causes, as I said, right, it was secondary to this ischemic coronary event. And what happens is, right, the cells start to dump the potassium contents into the surrounding extracellular fluid, right? So they'll say, right, during the acute ischemia, you have leakage of potassium, 
you have increased in, uh, intracellular potassium that depolarizes myocytes, right? And this is basically what's causing uh, this, right, to occur. Right? So we see these polymorphics, uh, ventricular tachycardias uh, sustained, and then if we don't correct them, right, if your heart rate is in excess of 150, 160, 170, 200, how long do you think you could maintain that condition? Not long. So your preload drops and you syncopate, right? And then your rhythm may change into DF, right? So this is, everybody agrees this is very dangerous, right? Uh, condition that we definitely need to know how to correct. Everybody agree? Yep. Right, so this, this was from uh, uh, a book uh, uh, called the Erosion's Emergency Medicine. They, they're saying what the treatment is for in hospital, and then I'm going to correlate it with your REMAC protocols to show you, right, where they get this from, right, and your AHA uh, criteria, right, AHA uh, guidelines. So they say for stable patients with ventricular tachycardia, we usually give an infusion of an amniotron infusion, right? Everybody know, right, uh, you've been utilizing your protocols, right? We mix 150 milligrams, right, amniotron. Right, into what? 100 ml D5W, right? And we infuse this uh, as our antiarrhythmic uh, agent, right? The second medication uh, they list is procainamide. You guys don't have this. This is a sodium channel blocker, right? You, you do not have it in our protocols, but it's effective. And the third one they list is lidocaine. We do have it, right? What's the dose for that? One, 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 one. And max dose is 100. And how, how fast are you pushing it? Over two minutes, right? So it's you basically drawing it up in a syringe form, right? You're drawing this up in a syringe form, and it's not like a rapid push. You basically over two minutes, you're you're doing it slow to uh, break the rhythm, right? So this, all of this is called uh, basically a chemical way to break the dysrhythmia, right? Uh, or a chemical cardioversion, if you will, right? Makes sense. And what's important uh, in this book, they said, right, out of all these three options, they said lidocaine uh, uh, infusion was uh, basically sh showed the lower success rates, and because of that, they relegated it to the alternative role. So based on this book and based on the studies they looked at, they, they said that amiodarone uh, was most effective, then procatamide, and, the, and then uh, lidocaine. From my personal experience, uh, I definitely seen lidocaine convert uh, techie with ventricular rhythms. I also seen amiodarone convert it. So a lot of times it's uh, dependent on the, uh, the doctor's preference, you know, like in, in the place I work, it's whatever they order. For your purposes, it's what your protocol entails, right? And whatever your agency bought and they have. So let's say if you carry amio in stock, that's what you're going to use. <clears throat> if you have lidocaine, you, you, that's what you're going to use. Sometimes, I'll get to your question in a second. Sometimes in your protocols, you will see the following thing. They'll say, if let's say for stable rhythm, you gave amio and it didn't convert the rhythm, and you still have sustained ventricular tachycardia or refractory. Refractory means it's not uh, uh, converting no matter what you do, right? It's not breaking. Then you may go to a different uh, antiarrhythmic like lidocaine. From my personal experience, you could kill someone like this, so call medical control and talk to them before you do that. Why? Because different drugs block different channels, right? Uh, different ion channels, and you can close them off completely. So you block, let's say with amio, you block their potassium channels, calcium channels. With lidocaine, you block their sodium channels. You may send them to profound bradycardia to the point where they'll, you know, break it down to like 40s, 30s, right? Yeah, you corrected their attack, but now, you know, they're breaking down and you have to make, may have to face them. So call medical control, right? That person may also be on beta blockers, right? To begin with, so you, you're blocking a lot of stuff with, with mixed dose uh, antiridnics, right? Yeah, that was my question. If you would call or if you would choose the drug based on your transport time, since one's over two minutes, one's over 10 minutes? Yeah. So, so like I said, it depends uh, Depends what you got. Let's say you carry both in yeah. your If you have carry both in your animals, uh, I would say if you determine your rhythm is ventricular in origin, right? It's Y complex, monomorphic, right? You can go with either one, amiodarone or lidocaine. Amiodarone has other potential side effects. Lidocaine has less, right? So you could go e either one, right? But in this, in this book, they say, uh, based on the studies they looked at, lidocaine was least effective. Right? So I'm just telling you this. For your purposes, you could use either one, right? And transport time would be a funny factor. Yeah, because the amniotin is going to give over 10 minutes. So it, it will still infuse it, right? And the other one is two minutes. Transport time is not the factor. Uh, in this regard, um, the factor is what's the best medication that will convert my dysrhythmia? And do I have indications that meet the... Uh, the requirements to give this medicine, and most importantly, I don't have any contraindications present. 
So you may have contraindications for amiodarone, the then you'll give lidocaine and, and vice versa, right? Right, and then for unstable patients, right? Unstable patients, those who have hypotension, altered mental status, shortness of breath, hypotension, confusion, right? We're gonna go with electricity, right? Electrical therapy. So they say basically, right? Any ventricular tachycardia that's either unstable or it's refractory to pharmacology, pharmacological intervention. So refractory means you give you gave the drug, it didn't break. Patient has still the same rhythm, right? So then you may call medical control, right? Uh, uh, and say, listen, we would like to proceed with uh, electrical therapy. For these patients who are alert and conscious and refractory, you may want to give what? Before you synchronize part of your word. Sedation. sedation, right? Which sedation would you like to administer? <coughs> Atomity, right? 0 0.15 milligrams, it's a short acting medication, right? They're definitely going to feel, right, the, you know, you're shocking them. So explain what you're going to do, right? Put the pads on, right? Get IV access. Right, you the treatment of the medicine. Uh, so, uh, monophasic, right, they say uh, you start at 100 joules and, uh, um, sorry, biphasic start at 100 joules, monophasic, you're also going to start with 100 joules. Max joule settings on monophasic units are going to be 360. Max joule setting on biphasic is going to be 200. In your river protocols, we start at 1 at 100, then we go 200, 300, 360, right? Uh, my only caveat with that is the moment you get to 360, and you've been giving those shocks, you know, stop and think what you're, what's going on. Like, why is the rhythm not breaking? Maybe you're dealing with hyperkalemia, right? Maybe it's not secondary to a cardiac origin. Maybe it's, in fact, the guy missed his dialysis appointments, and you're dealing with, you know, hyperkalemic status, right? Any questions about this, right? So I think, uh, and there's very important, important one that some of you guys missed when we were testing, that when you have unstable, Right, ventricular tachycardia, and you want to perform synchronized cardio version. There's a specific button you gotta press. Yeah. So just to show you one more time. So when we are when we are testing, right, make sure make sure there's a sync button that's pressed here. It's blinking. It's flicking your arm waves. Uh, some of you guys, you know, you were saying I'm gonna perform synchronized cardio version. You didn't engage this button. You came in, you basically did the following. Okay, I'm gonna go with 100. I'm gonna charge. I'm gonna make sure everybody's clear, right? Everyone's clear. And what did I just do? Fibrillator. The fibrillator. So uh, that will be a critical failure, just as, as long as you guys understand why. Why? Because we wanna terminate this rhythm, we wanna give it on a specific time, right? Cycle. <coughs> so synchronization must be engaged. This monitor, right? You see sync engaged, then you charge. The moment I deliver this, it's going to dump. So I, I shock. You see how sync disengages. So if I had to go 200, I have to do what? Amen. Get it again, right? If I proceed to just shock them at 200, then I defibrillate them. Do you know why this manufacturer did this? Because on, on the MRX, on the MRX monitor, it will stay engaged. But this dumps it. Exactly, right? So if your patient went to pulseless VTAC or, pul or VFIT, Right? Uh, this is, monitor is already at a point where you could just right away defibrillate because it was a witness arrest. So what I'm saying to you is, we'll tell you a ventricular tachycardia, unstable, you synchronize cardio at 100, you check your patient, there's no pulse, and he still has VTAC, or he converts to VF, <coughs> ventricular fibrillation, the button's already off so that you could just uh, go to 360, charge, and defibrillate. Make sense? But make sure you know the monitor you're using. If, if uh, that feature is sustained, should draw, right? Make sure you know which model you do. All right, so let's go. You know, this is your rematch protocols, right? Before we know what treatments to use, you got to determine are they stable or unstable, right? So here they give you uh, some criteria, right? So we say, right, for adult patients, let's go with unstable first. They say systolic blood pressure less than 90, MAP less than 65. They have altered mental status, right? So it's basically like this they have hypotension. Uh, altered mental status, chest pain, shortness of breath, right? Hypotension confusion means there's not, not enough perfusion to the heart. The moment you have these points, right? Does, do they have to be all of them present? No, right? If you have, right, uh, someone who, let's say, has sustained hypertension, they walk around 200 over 100, they don't take their medicine. All of a sudden, their blood pressure, get at 110 over 100. But their altered mental status, they're diaphoretic, right? 
and you notice right there's a dysrhythmia that's on the monitor, they may be candidate for the unstable category, right? They don't have to have all of them. Now, this is unstable. What is stable? Stable basically means any rhythm uh, or dysrhythmia that's not associated with these conditions. So they, they have good blood pressure, they have good mentation, they're able to converse with you, right? They're not diaphoretic, they're not cool, pale, right, to the touch, right? Uh, and those patients who are in this category, they're gonna get medications first. Patients in this category are gonna get electrical therapy. Right? Any questions about this? Yeah. yeah. They want you to treat the dysrhythmia before you get a swap. Yeah. So this. And you're not really getting to the point of the So usually that, that was a safety feature implemented. Why? Because let's say you put someone on the monitor, right? And you see white complex tachycardia, right? And the, right, the rate is 200, right? The thought process was if you were to do a 12 EDKG, right? Uh, it will extend the time before it, you, know, you could correct them. And the longer it goes, they may go into pulseless condition, right? However, I'll say that is not a good uh, thing that they added, right? Treating unstable dysrhythmia prior to initiation quality. I have no of a particular case where a person had a third degree heart block, right? The medics uh, said we have to treat the underlying rhythm before we can do a tolly. Make sense? Third degree, the person was altered mental status and conscious. They started to pace, they never did a tolly. They brought the patient to the hospital, right? The hospital put their own pacer on, and they paced. And they called the tech to do an EKG, and the tech came. The tech obviously doesn't know to turn off the uh, pacemaker. He, oh. he did a, a tolly with a paced rhythm. So it was basically shows you a rhythm like this, right? Non-diagnostic, right? You'll see a small in the QRS for all your leads like this, for all of them. So you cannot determine the ST segment changes. They called cardiology console because they thought the guy is going to get a pacemaker placed. Cardiology came and said, can we see a tolly? They showed them. They said, this is a pace rhythm. Can we see a non pace 12 lead? So if nobody did it. They stopped the pacer. They're a 12 lead. The guy has a STEMI. But don't we do it like before, after? Yeah, I would say, I would say uh, do it uh, before. If you're doing pacing, do it before, right? So get your thing done. Or uh, if you have not done it, at least tell the hospital staff we don't have a diagnostic 12 lead EKG. So make sure you run your own 12 lead EKG before you switch them to your own pacemaker, right? So you definitely want to have a baseline toll lead, right? A lot of times in the hospital setting, even if the person has a ventricular tachycardia or SVT or rapid AFib, they will definitely do a toll lead just to confirm that is in fact monomorphic or polymorphic or what's the underlying rhythm or the other topics are. The toll leads are always done before treatment decision because you don't want to make that type of mistake. In New York City, uh, they put this there and I think this, this was probably uh, a safety feature at some point, maybe a medic did something incorrect, so they added here. This is, a, this I would say, this can kill a person, this, this line here. Right. Uh, yeah. Um, so in the protocol, it says that um, antidepressants can cause why complex yeah. tachycardia is. And then they also say that amiodarone can, like, yeah, we're gonna next week when we talk about torsad, I'll explain that thoroughly, right? So next week, wait, ask me that again. You had a question? No? Okay. You forgot? <laughs> if it comes back to two years, let me know. So this is the whole sequence, right? Uh, uh, unstable, right? You notice how there's three things. There it says perform uh, initial synchronized cardioversion, right? Then you repeat synchronized cardioversion, and then you have administration of it on your own. Do we do all of this? No? Uh, the synchronous cardio reverse, if it works, then no. It doesn't, then So let me give you a case. You got a guy, monomorphic VTAC, heart rate is 200. Per person has blood pressure 60 or 40, altered mental status, right? Confusion, right? <coughs> diaphoresis. You come in, put them on the monitor, 100 joules, you, you, you synchronize cardio reverse, break the rhythm, right? Let's say he's normal sinus. You go to all lead, right? Maybe there's some ischemia, there's no ST segment changes. Like there's no ST segment elevations, we say. Maybe ischemia is present. Do we give a meal over? Yes. yes. Why? You don't want them to go back. Yeah, so, so we do we do give an amiodarone in case they are to reconvert in the same rhythm. So you could initiate your antiarrhythmic. Be careful, we're gonna talk about some of the side effects. This will this may cause hypotension for the person. Right? So be very careful with that. Uh, now this this here, right, this is for your stable condition. If person has good mentation, good blood pressure, 
right? You could have option A or B. Option A was is amiodarone. Option B is lidocaine, right? Again, would depend on what you carry, right? This I would say uh, carries less side effect as opposed to amiodarone. This has a very broad action. This has very narrow action. This has a lot of side effects. This has a little, uh, less side effects, and you definitely have different contraindications for these medications. Uh, I, I think both of them work for white complex tachyarrhythmias, so they they definitely work. Um, so uh, they're there. One thing that I'll say here, they say if one did not work, so they'll say for persistent, stable detox, right? And you already gave any anterior dysrhythmic medications above, administer the other one, right? So be careful that I'll call medical control and just to clarify with them because you will you can essentially close off all the ion channels, right? And if they're on their own calcium blockers or beta blockers, you may have profound right hypotension, uh, heart block, and basically send them from VTAC to a brain dysrhythmia to a cardiac arrest. So if you gave one, stick with one. Uh, if it's not breaking, you know it probably is a <laughs> a better thing to be doing. Yeah, excellent. Say it loud. Yeah. So if you give your drug, it's not working. Right. Pull out of control. Give them sedation. Right. If they need to, and then go to synchronized cardioversion. Then start mixing your medications. You, you block off too many channels, you will kill them. I I I have no personally of a case where a very I should say um, <clears throat> overzealous resident did that, and then they have to pay the person. Uh, for for this stuff, we're going to get to next week about Torsad. We'll talk about this. Any questions about this, the front portion? This is clear? All right, this is just a close up uh, of this protocol, right? Showing you standing orders. When you go to your stations, right? I just I want to clarify. For now, I don't expect you to tell me all the medical control options. I do expect you to tell me all the standing orders. So if I give you a case, unstable, uh, monomorphic VTAC, I expect you to know. Uh, where they fall and what treatments to give. All right. Uh, so this is the sedation medication in case your patient needs to be cardiovert and they are alert conscious. Right. So they say for adult patient requiring procedural sedation, they could give your options. Right. Atomidate, diazepam, midazolam, lorazepam, Uh uh This, this, this. These are benzodiazepines. They lower blood pressure. So your patient is unstable. Blood pressure 60 over 40. If you give any of these, you'll drop their blood pressure, you'll kill them, right? So in those settings, right, comfort care may be not the best thing, right? If they're altered, blood pressure is low, just go straight to cardioversion, right? But if their alert blood pressure is good, right, then you will, you will select this method. But no, these these will drop the blood pressure. Atomidate is more cardiostable, right? 0 0.15 milligrams, max dose of 20, right? So these are the medications you give. Uh, uh, just a question. Do we ever give this medicine, option A, for transcutaneous pacing? No, because it's short acting. Short acting, right? This is only for synchronized cardioversion because you're basically going to deliver that energy quickly, right? Uh, and for pacing, it's sustained, right? You're going to start <coughs> pacing, you're going to take them to the hospital 15, 20 minutes transport time, right? For that, they may need analgesia, right? Maybe fentanyl, maybe morphine. It's not listed here. You may call medical control. These medications do not take away pain. They give you anxiolysis, they give you uh, anterograde amnesia, they give you hypnosis, you go to sleep, right? They give you anxiolysis, you don't feel as much anxiety. They don't not take away pain. They do not take away pain. So we'll talk about the, the stuff I, you would ask me. So next next week, ask me about this. I'll explain to you what this is here for. Right? So this is your ACLS guidelines. Uh, um, you will learn this towards the end of the course. but. Uh, Maybe hard to see, but I'll go through it. So basically, it says here you have a patient who has a heart rate typically greater than 130 beats per minute. So this is they have sustained ventricular tachycardia. We're going to identify the rhythm, and the next thing they show you here, right? What are you going to be doing? So you're going to maintain their airway. You're going to give oxygen that they're hypoxic. You're going to play some cardiac monitoring. You're going to get IV access. You're going to do 12 EDKG. That's standard, right? And then they they go they go down. Are they are they unstable or stable? So how do how you determine unstable? Hypotension, acutely awkward mental status, signs of shock, ischemic chest discomfort, acute heart failure, right? So all these says they're unstable. If they're unstable, yes, you perform synchronized cardioversion. Okay? You, you'll consider sedation, right? Uh, and you may uh, consider, right, adenosine. For your purposes, uh, 
right? We're going to go straight to synchronous cardio version. And if they're refractory, right, you need uh, full medical control or expert counsel, but may, you may need to change your uh, treatment. That's just like you have someone in hyper and you start shocking them 100, 200, 360, 360, 360, 360. Maybe I need to stop this hyper right? I need to call or, you know, get a better. <coughs> now, let's say they do not have these conditions. No. Is your QRS wide or narrow? So wide means they're probably ventricular in origin. So we say yes. So here they, they have some a medication that you should not, it's not in your protocols. They give adenosine because they want to see what's the underlying rhythm. Do not give this medicine. It's not in your protocols. And then the other one is expert counsel because it could be polymorphic, right, in nature. So you don't know uh, what's the best treatment in that case. Like in torsad, you may need to give magnesium, for example, right? Uh, if refractory, you're going to go here. So this uh, this should mimic your uh, REMAC protocols. It does, in a way, I'm just explaining to you right where they get that from. They get it from the AHA guidelines, it's the 2020 AHA guidelines. Your antiarrhythmics, they have, again, procatamide, amiodarone, that's subtle. It's a type 3 antiarrhythmic. It's like amiodarone, it belongs your QT if they want. Uh, this is right the algorithm for your uh, electrical cardioversion, right? So you determine there's a tech arrhythmia, heart rate must exceed 150. If the heart rate is not above 150, we usually do not intervene. Why not? If the heart rate is less than 150, we usually don't perform electrical therapy. How come? It's stable. It's, it's, not, it's not per se they're stable. Is that they're not at a point that they're going to become uh, uh, compromised, that they're going to lose consciousness. So. And we have to look and treat underlying causes. Like what, maybe have sinus attack at 1:30, right? I, am I gonna synchronize cardio work? No. Maybe the guy got sepsis. You have that. Kind of exactly, yeah. exactly, right? So I gotta find out what's going on, right? So if the heart rate is not about 150, right? Do not start shocking them. Uh, so what you're gonna do, right? Right? You're gonna place them on your monitor. You're gonna have mox oxygen provided. You you wanna have your suction device, IV line, intubation equipment ready in case they go into cardiac arrest. You're going to pre-medicate, they basically will see if they're conscious and alert, you're going to give them sedation. And then you're going to go ahead and they give you energy settings. Uh, here, they, it's not like your protocols, 100, 200, 300. They give you different energy selections for if it's atrial in nature versus ventricular. When we get to the ACLS, you'll learn about this. For now, uh, I'm not holding you responsible for this. Uh, something else uh, that they list here, uh, they, there's a common thing here, they say if a patient is critical, right, you, uh, and you have a problem basically doing synchronized, you're going to go to other synchronized shocks. The reason they added here this point is sometimes you're in a hospital setting or, or you're not sure how to use your equipment to do the synchronized cardio version, they just say you just go straight to, right, uh, different relation for those patients. But hopefully you guys know how to do it. Okay. Um, uh, what else is important to know? We talked about the synchronized mode to engage it, uh, right? So they say uh, you want to press the sync. Very important. It's very important to press this. Some monitors like this one, it, it will dump it, right? It will dump it because, right, uh, it allows immediate shock to be delivered uh, in case there is a DL. Right? So this is why they have it. Here. But know your equipment. Uh, Phillips, yeah, Phillips will keep it, right? Uh, so this is basically for uh, uh, your patients. If you if your patient had a run of V type, right, and you convert him, are you gonna RMA him to stay home? No, right? Uh, so the guy says, "I'm fine. Look, I'm feeling better. So I want to stay home." Right? So why not? He could uh, go back. He could, he could go back exactly, right? He could go back, and the reason why you want to take him to the hospital, perhaps they may need to either your medication. But they may need to implant a uh, defibrillator right uh, uh, in the chest so that the rhythm if were to recur at home, right? They have the implantable right defibrillator there to work for the person. So if they had even like a run of VTAC that you saw, do not RMA those patients. If you corrected their VTAC, do not RMA those patients. Even the patient insists, you say you explain to them what is going to happen. This will occur again. If we don't come, you're going to die. If you still insist, you call medical control, say, hey doc, we got a person here, got a V-type, we converted him, he wants to stay home, he wants to RMA. We try to convince him, maybe you can. Right? Usually I tell him flat out, you're gonna die if you stay home, because this occurs, right? This is not a rhythm that you could sustain life with. Right? And if they still wanna stay home, I call medical control. Okay? 